Okay guys, um, so this lab is gonna be over the Frank Hertz experiment. And basically the, the idea behind this experiment was to prove that the energy of an electron is quantized. Um, so what I have drawn here is the energy level diagram for neon. So this is, we'll say neon. Okay, and we can see that the ground state of neon is located at 2p6, which is just the orbital um, 2p6. Right, and we have all of these possible orbitals that these ground state electrons can then be excited to. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing in this lab, right, is we're gonna be basically striking these ground state electrons with another electron which has been accelerated by some voltage. Okay, and now this, ex this uh, excited electron can jump to any number of these other excited levels depending on the amount of energy that this incoming electron has, right? So if, if we come up and this electron, let's say, excites to, for instance, just as an example, an electron gets excited to this energy level here, this 2P54S1, right? So we've, we've decreased the P orbital by one electron and that electron is now located in the 4S orbital. Um, this electron can now do a number of different things after it's been excited. Um, it can fall directly back down to the ground state and then emit a photon in doing so, okay? And so the energy of this emitted photon, we'll see energy of that emitted photon is gonna be Planck's constant, which is H times the frequency of the emitted uh, photon. So the frequency of the light emitted due to this electron dropping down to the ground state, okay? It turns out that for neon, um, this would be in the UV range, okay, if it just directly dropped down to ground state. What you'll see whenever we're doing this experiment is we'll actually be able to visualize um, excited neon uh, fluorescing, meaning we can actually uh, see this photon being emitted, which means that it's in the visible range. So after we excite these ground state electrons, it's not going to fall back down to the ground state. It's actually going to fall to some other excited state. For instance, if this electron, instead of falling to the ground state, fell to this excited level, the 3s orbital, right, and it would have an energy equal to hf, um, so here's the photon coming out, right, this would be in the visible range, okay. Um, so what we're going to do is use this kind of idea of these incoming electrons exciting and then emitting a photon in order to prove that this is the correct way of thinking about it, or that the energy of these electrons are quantized, right? Uh, again, again, quantization means that it can only be located, the electron can only be located in one of these allowed energy levels. It can't locate, be located anywhere in between, okay? And what you'll see um, here is uh, that these energy levels, so this is like 3P1 energy level, it has some width to it. Right, so there are there are multiple energy levels allowed within just this one energy level, all right? And that's due to this fact that for a p orbital, right, we have three different spots that the electrons can can occupy, and since we have one electron, this electron isn't necessarily just going to fall into that first spot, right? Which would correspond to so this is l is it can have a possible values of minus one, zero, and one. So it's not necessarily going to fall into that first minus one value, right? It may, instead of populating that, it may come over here. And it may also have some spin down, right? So depending on where that electron ends up within this p orbital is going to determine these, uh, this, the energy level here. And so what you'll see in your manual is this, this, uh, this way of denoting exactly where, or the, the precise electron configuration, so a way of denoting exactly where this electron has ended up, is by using these term sim symbols. So it, you may see something like this. You may see like 2P5, uh, it may say 3P, meaning that it's in this 3P orbital somewhere, so it's been excited somewhere here. And then you'll see this other term, right? It may say something like 3S1. This 3S1 is just a term, it's called a term symbol. And basically all it does is denotes the specific electron configuration. We're not gonna spend too much time talking about this, but it basically tells you exactly where this electron is located in the orbital, okay? It, it's a little bit uh, too kind of outside the scope of this course to really talk about this in depth, 
Um, so we're not going to do that, but just know that this is just a way of denoting the specific orbital within the 3p level, okay? Um, it's not really important anyways, because all we're worried about is that, all we need to worry about is the fact that these orbitals are, are quantized, right? We're not worried about necessarily the, the exact specific level necessarily. Um, so let's talk about now the setup that we're going to use in order to be able to, to demonstrate this, this process here. So what we'll have is called the Frank Hertz tube. So there will be some glass tube, right? Like so. And in this tube, we're gonna fill it with helium, or neon, sorry. We're filling it with neon. So these are all of the neon atoms within the tube. Okay, um, and then what we're gonna do is be shooting electrons into this tube. So we need some apparatus in order to be able to do that. So what we're gonna have is a cathode here. This is our cathode, meaning it has a negative charge, right? And in order, and then we're also gonna have an anode. But the anode is actually gonna be a grid, so it's gonna allow electrons to be able to pass through it, okay? But the anode is here, and this is a lot of plus. So this cathode and this anode, that's gonna be supplying the accelerating voltage, okay? But in order to lift off these electrons from this cathode, we first need to heat it in order to make these electrons more readily available to be able to be accelerated, right? So there's also gonna be a length of wire or filament down here. This is our heater. That will heat this cathode up and those electrons will then be brought to the surface of the cathode and then they'll be accelerated towards the anode by this accelerating voltage established across the cathode and the anode. Okay, so we're gonna have some electrons coming out of here, like an electron gun. This is very similar to the setup that we saw in charge to mass ratio and various other setups, right? Um, what we also have here at the top is gonna be a collector that we can then use to collect the electrons. So we have a collector. Um, and this collector, we're gonna apply a reverse bias to it. meaning I'm gonna give it uh, a, a negative charge, right? So it's actually gonna be pushing the electrons down, um, giving it a reverse bias. And what we'll see here, right, is initially when these, if I have a very small uh, voltage here, uh, established, the accelerating voltage is small, I'll keep this reverse bias constant throughout this whole process. Um, if this is small, these electrons will just collide elastically with all of these helium atoms. It'll continue to accelerate towards the anode. And then after it passes the anode, okay, if those electrons don't have enough energy um, to overcome this reverse bias, they'll be pushed back and they'll recombine with the anode. Okay, so if we graph what's happening here, where on the x-axis we have our accelerating voltage, V, and then on the y-axis, we have our collector current. So it's the amount of electrons that is being collected up here at the collector. Collector current. Initially, we're gonna get very few, right? Very, very few electrons coming due to this reverse bias, right? And then at some voltage, right? As, as we can increase this voltage, these electrons will have more and more energy. They'll be able to overcome this reverse bias and be caught by the collector. So we'll see this over time start to increase. Okay. Now, at some point, this will start to level off, right? And then it's leveling off because at some voltage, these electrons here are no longer going to be colliding elastically with these neon atoms. They're instead colliding elastically, meaning they're giving their energy to them, right? So at some point in here, the electrons at this point in the tube will have enough energy once we increase our voltage enough to be able to excite these helium atoms, right? And we, we've now given it enough energy or we've now given it the energy required in order to put the electron from this ground state into one of these excited states, okay? So that means since the electron is giving its energy away um, to these neon atoms, it's colliding inelastically. The electrons coming out the other side of this area are going to have much less velocity than what they had coming from the cathode or before they collided here at the, with the neon atoms. 
Okay, so since they've, they've lost some energy here, they're now, again, not able to overcome this reverse bias, right? They'll, they'll pass through the anode, but they don't have enough to be able to be collected by the collector because of this reverse bias. It'll be pushed back down and then collected at the anode instead. So what you'll see is whenever we start to see a, a, an area of excitation, you'll actually see the collector current go down, and then it'll, it'll become to a minimum. Okay, and we're still through this entire process though, increasing our accelerating voltage. Okay, so at some, again, at some voltage, if we continue to increase our voltage, these electrons coming out are gonna have more and more energy. And so as we continue to increase our voltage, these electrons will eventually gain enough energy to again excite another band of helium, or of, I'm sorry, of neon atoms here. So we'll get a second ring some distance away, right? Because they still have to be accelerated after they leave here before they are able to get enough energy to excite a second band. Okay, so what we'll see is, right, um, if they're, we increase our voltage, it comes up, we're getting a lot of collector current, and then it, again, these, these now get enough energy to then excite a second band, and then at this second uh, band that we see, we'll get a second minimum, okay? And now, depending on the length of our tube, right, we can see this process repeat over and over. Okay, our tube uh, in lab, we'll see, is actually sh too short, or it's not too short, but it's so short that we'll be able to see these first two bands, and then after a while, right, the, the electrons will become, will have so much energy that, that will, they'll just kind of all bleed together, and we'll see just one solid, uh, in, turns out, orange mass. Right, or one solid orange election, because all of these electrons are now scattering, scattering off of each other, and we don't get these nice bands that we're able to see um, at higher voltages. J just because of the length of this tube, right, the electrons are confined to such a small area that at, at a certain voltage, right, they're all just gonna have so much energy that it, it, we don't see these, these nice bands. Um, but from this graph, what we can determine is it turns out that the separation of the of any two corresponding points so if we go from from one uh if we go from like one trough here to another trough this distance here is actually going to be equal to the excitation energy right it's the the amount of energy that it took to to overcome the uh the the, the amount of or it's, it's the amount of energy that we put into the neon atom in order for it to be excited, right? Um, it's that, that minimum excita excitation energy. Um, so what we can, we can use this information now in order to find uh, some experimental value for, for this, this excitation energy level over here, right? Because that's what we want to first know is, is where am I being excited to? Um, and, and that's what this graph will tell us. So if we come over here to, and make a second graph, and then on the X, we're gonna graph the number of the peak, right? And trough, trough, I don't know how to spell that, but it's not important. Um, we have one, two, or three, the number of peaks. So we take, and then on the Y, we're gonna have the, the energy. Energy. Um, corresponding to that peak, right? Um, and so we'll take uh, the position of this first trough, say, like here, and we'll graph the energy uh, on the X that corresponds to that first trough. So we might get a point like that. Then we'll come to this second trough, and then we'll graph this energy there. And that, so we'll get some higher energy, right? Because it's higher, uh, it's further down on the X axis. Um, and then we'll take our third trough, that point there and then we'll graph its energy on this scale right and then we'll do the same thing for the for the peaks so we'll take the energy of this first peak and you'll see it's actually lower than the trough so you'll get a peak here and then we'll take the energy of this second peak and we'll put it there at two and then the energy of the third peak we'll put at three okay and so this and if we graph a line of best fit through all six of these points we'll see that the slope will be equal to the energy of the excited 
uh, the energy of the excited level. Or it's the, the energy of the level that we're being excited into, right? If we hit the slope of this line, right? And so basically this, this, this is just one way of, of quickly finding the difference between this point and this point and this point and that point and this and that and this and that and then averaging all of them together. Instead of finding all of these differences between all of these corresponding peaks and troughs and then averaging them, we can just graph it and then find the slope and that's another way of finding this average um, uh, for the excited level, energy level. Okay. Um, so once we have our energy of our excited level, we can then use this equation, E is equal to HF for orange light. And it's orange because that's, that's what color these disks will be, right? We'll see, when we see these disks, we'll see them illuminate in, in the orange color, which means that this photon, so if we look over here, let's say that, it, so it gets excited here and then it falls back down to this energy level, right? That means the energy difference between these two levels corresponds to an energy of orange light, because that, because the, the, the energy emitted by that, the energy of this photon has to be equal to the energy difference of these, these two levels. Um, so we're going to use um, this equation to find what the energy of orange light is. And then once we do that, um, we, can then, we can then determine the energy level we are falling to. All right, and then that's basically the lab. So this lab is primarily qualitative, right? There's not going to be a whole lot of, of analysis. Um, we're going to use this graph to find and then use the, the positions of these peaks and troughs to get this energy or this slope, which will then give us this excited energy level. And then we'll use this equation for orange light, subtract that energy for that orange light from our excited energy level to find the energy level that we're falling to. Okay, and now this picture here is within your manual, so you'll find a picture that looks something like this, and then the energy range for each of these levels is, is indicated for you. Okay, so whenever we find the slope of this line, uh, you'll then look for which of these energy levels corresponds to that, uh, that slope, or w which of these energy levels has an energy equal to the slope of this line. Okay, and then once you find the energy of the orange light, you'll just subtract it from that excited energy, and that'll tell you the, the level that we're falling to. Okay, and then doing all of this, right, is just demonstrating that this is the correct representation, right? If, if energy was not quantized, we wouldn't be emitting an orange photon. We wouldn't be emitting a photon at all, really, right? It's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's even kind of hard to imagine what would happen, um, let's say, if this were continuous, right? The reason that we have an orange photon being emitted is due to the fact that these energy levels are quantized because the energy... Uh, of the photon has to be equal to the energy difference of these two energy levels. All right, so um, that's kind of the theory and how this uh, will work. I will we'll, um, uh, come back and we'll show you how this looks in lab, um, and then you'll be able to use uh, the data that we'll take from that. Um, that will be, again, located on Canvas, um, and then you'll be able to use that data to then find uh, or to prove that energy is quantized. All right, see you in a second. Okay guys, here we are. Uh, this is for the Frank Hertz lab. So here we can see our tube that's filled with neon. Here we can see an area that we can then view. Um, this is our power supply. So we have uh, this knob controls our heater, right? And, it, and it, it runs to the tube, which is then this piece here is then connected to the filament, which then heats up. Um, and then we then use uh, the electrons that are brought to the surface by this heater and accelerated by this here, which is connected to the anode. So this knob here provides our accelerating voltage. Um, we can see that this here is hooked up to the cathode, um, which is what is the source of our electrons, right? This is what's actually being heated up. Um, we can have our ground. So here's our ground wire. Um, and then here is our reverse bias, which is just supplying a constant voltage, okay? Um, so let's, and we, we're on our oscilloscope over here, on our Y, right, what we're viewing is going to be uh, basically analogous to the collector current, um, and then the X is, um, 
the X's are accelerating voltage. So as I turn this accelerating voltage up, you'll see this dot here start to move across. And then uh, as, it, as it goes up, you'll actually start to see it go up and down across the screen as we're able to see uh, the disks start to form in here. So let's go ahead and turn up our accelerating voltage and see what happens. So as we start to increase the voltage, you can see that dot on the oscilloscope starts to move. It'll at some point hit a peak and then it'll start to come back down. And then as it comes down and hits a minimum, we can see inside of this tube here, a little glow start to form, and that's gonna be our first disc, okay? Um, so you can see that this disc starts to form whenever this is at a minimum, as we talked about in the lab, because the electron's energy is being transferred to those neon atoms, and, and because of that, they don't have enough energy to actually reach the collector. So let's continue to move up our acceleration uh, voltage and see what happens. So if we continue to watch on our screen, the voltage is going to go up because we're moving across the X. Um, the collector current is going up because that dot is starting to move upwards. And then at some point, it should, yep, here we go, it's starting to drop back down. And then as it's dropping back down, if you look inside of that viewing screen, you'll see a second disk start to form. So it's a little hard to see. Um, it's a little bit better in person, but you can see a bottom disc and a top disc separated by that thin uh, area where there is no light. Okay, so this is our second disc has been formed, and you can see uh, our dot over here is, again, at a minimum. Now, what I can do instead of manually turning up this voltage is I can have it sweep through the voltages, and it'll sweep at 50 hertz. Okay, so... Uh, It'll sweep through from going from zero all the way to 80 volts, and it'll do that at a frequency of 50 hertz. And the reason that we want to do that is so that we can actually view the entire uh, graph on the screen rather than this just this single dot, right? This single dot corresponds to only one single accelerating voltage. Now, if I start to sweep through it and I do it at a speed such that I can actually view the entire waveform, then we can then use that waveform to measure the positions of those peaks and troughs more accurately. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's switch this all the way to its maximum. And then we'll ramp from zero to its maximum. You can see now that we can actually see this waveform on our screen. Um, because we're sweeping from zero to 90, right, we're not able to actually see those distinct disks in here anymore because, again, at a certain voltage, right, due to the scattering of the electrons within the tube, um, we're, they, they kind of disrupt that, that pattern. Um, so since it's, yeah, since it's sweeping from zero to 90, we're not able to see that inside of here anymore. But we were able to see that before, and what's important now is that we're able to measure these, these positions of these peaks. So we can change the position, the X position, you can see as I change that, I can move this entire waveform to the left and to the right. So if I want to measure this position, and it may be hard for you to see, let me see if I can zoom in on there. Um, in this bottom left-hand corner is actually, it tells me the position that this central line is located at. And so if I move the position such that that central line is lined up with one of those peaks, I can then measure the voltage at that peak the accelerating voltage at that peak. So let's just keep on moving that over. I at least want to show you one example of how this is done. All right, so that's good enough lined up. If you're doing this lab, you would want to do it a little bit more accurately. Um, but you can see that that central line is now lined up with that peak. And the position that that central line is now located at is going to be equal to, uh, it says negative 2.34. All right, and it's negative because we've shifted this whole waveform to the left. So we can really ignore the negative sign, and all we really care about is the 2.34. All right, now, if we also look here um, on our power supply, it says this X out, and X is, again, what we're reading for on this X axis. X is the accelerating voltage. You can see that it says potential divided by 10. So whatever we, voltage that we read here is actually going to be divided by 10. So we said 2.34, I think. So we actually, that, that voltage actually corresponds to 23.4 volts. Okay, so we have that central line lined up. We multiply it by 10. That gives us the position of that peak. Then we would shift the position. Now we want that trough position. And to get that trough, we just move it so that the central line, that central line is now located at a negative 3.16, which corresponds to 31.6 uh, volts uh, for the accelerating voltage. 
All right, and that's how you would just go about finding the positions of all of these peaks. You would need three peaks and three troughs. So you can see as I continue to move the position of this guy over, we'll see more peaks and more troughs that you could get the position of, right? And those peaks and troughs just correspond to um, the disk forming and then uh, dissipating. All right, so that's how this lab would have performed if had you been in here. Um, yeah, so yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time.